definition I'm going to bother with today. Conflict is when one party perceives that someone else may negatively or adversely affect their interests. Uh, and there's two things you want to notice about this definition. First, it has to be perceived. Uh, so if you don't see it as a conflict situation, then in your mind, it, it doesn't exist. Um, and the converse is also true. Uh, people may not see it as a conflict objectively by any standard, but other people, even if they're delusional, may perceive there to be a conflict, and then in their mind it is, and they behave accordingly. Uh, so it's, it's a nice way to put it, it's all in your mind. So it's just a figment of your imagination, it doesn't really exist. The second thing you want to notice about conflict is we often assume it's negative, conflict bad, harmony good. Uh, that's not really a useful or accurate uh, way to approach it because all of us have had conflicts with people, whether it's family or colleagues, and once we resolve it, we learn something about the other person, true? And maybe we learn something about ourselves or the relationship. And as a result, we can improve the relationship or the, the working arrangement. So in that sense, it could be useful if it's handled in a mature and enlightened way. I want to show you guys a little comic strip. I know you only have two in your newspaper. Um, and this one isn't there anymore. Okay, so what do you think about that? Is there a conflict going on here? I see a couple of brave ladies who actually show their face, so good morning. Is that Anita? You see, Anita. Yeah. Good morning. Do you see a conflict going on here? I think as you say perceiving, so maybe from one person is perceiving it as a conflict. Okay, so one person perceives it as a conflict and perhaps the other does not. So is there a conflict? Yes or no? I guess no. the answer is both. <laughs> As you said, it depends on who is doing the perceiving. So from Lucy's point of view, there is a conflict. And she sees a problem. She's upset. It affects the way she relates to, to her brother. And uh, it affects the way she feels. But from Linus's perspective, he doesn't see it as a conflict and he doesn't behave as such. He doesn't get upset. He doesn't take any action as a result of that situation. Now, of these two people, who do you admire more? Do you admire Lucy who is upset and wants to change things or, or probably change Linus? Or do you admire Linus who, who stays calm, doesn't let it bother him, just goes about his business? Uh, having taught this course for about 18 years, I can tell you historically, almost everybody admires Linus more. But that's not always the way behave. I think there are certain incentives in life, especially in the workplace, to not just sit there 
And some people say, this is not acceptable. I have to do something about it, especially at the management level, because that's their job to do things, to make things happen, to change. Um, are you likely to change this other person? Probably not likely. Okay. Um, as we'll see, it's, it's a lot easier to change yourself than to change somebody else. Um, but that's not the only uh, two possibilities. It's not a binary issue as a lot of people think. There's a third possibility that we'll talk about towards the end of the session, which will be a revelation for most of you. So why is there a conflict here, or at least in the perception of one party, why do they see a conflict? What is the source of this? Or do we not really know? She says, you do it all the time, it drives me crazy. So it's probably a little habit of his or a mannerism. So the source of the conflict is what? Is it the thing that he does or says? Or is it the way she responds to it? Or is it simply the fact that there's a difference between what she sees and what she would like? The disparity between her reality and her ideal. And that's actually a very common source of conflict. Um, or is it a miscommunication issue? A lot of conflicts result from a misunderstanding or a miscommunication. In fact, most of the, the sitcoms on TV revolve around a particular misunderstanding. It's a standard formula because it's so universal in our experience. All right, so what I'd like to do now uh, is give you guys a little chance to brainstorm among yourselves. We're gonna break you up into little groups of about four people and put you into uh, breakout rooms. I don't know who's gonna be with you and I'm not gonna listen in. You'll have about five minutes to talk to your uh, I guess you can call it virtual roommates and discuss specifically what are some of the sources of conflict in our lives, whether it's at home or in the workplace. So we mentioned a couple, uh, misunderstanding or miscommunication and different expectations. And in Lucy's case, it seems like she's pretty upset. So maybe it's just emotion. Is emotion a source of conflict sometimes? So that'll get you started. Uh, we're gonna break you up into your rooms in a couple of seconds, and you'll have five minutes to discuss in your group what are some sources of conflict in the workplace, the things that provoke us to feel threatened and maybe to respond accordingly to protect our interests. And after five minutes of chatting, uh, we'll come back and consolidate some of your ideas. All right. So let me see if, Exna, are you here? Are you with us? All right, I don't see her. I think I'll have to do this myself. So let me. Arrange this. Okay. All right, let me let me get them to work on this. I'll be back in one second.
okay, I don't see them getting the breakout room, so we'll just have to do it on our own. Um, I don't think I've got the authority. I don't see a way for me to do it without Aventus. Um, so let's just uh, take some ideas. Let me get the whiteboard started. And uh, I'm pretty sure I could do that. And we'll come up with some ideas of where uh, conflict originates, what are some of the sources. Okay. So anybody have one to share? Um, what's the topic? <laughs> Sources of conflict. Conflict. Um, okay, I think they. Just, yeah, maybe it's just one that I will do the opposite end for a start. Would it be better? Normally, is the conflict is normally one end and the other end is opposite, <laughs> which is mutually uncollaborative. Um, okay, Meishin, I'm not sure what you're getting at. Uh, are you saying uh, like a class of personalities? I don't know, maybe. I don't know how to start a conflict. Yeah. There must be something, then the other side must be like having an objective or something, an objection or something. That's why I caused the conflict. Okay, so, so you've got different objectives. Or different goals. Is that accurate? I mean, that's my understanding for conflict. Right. Different goals or objective. And we already mentioned misunderstanding or miscommunication. I notice a misunderstanding is also a way of saying different understandings. So they understand one thing, you understand something else, and that difference is the conflict. I think we mentioned emotions, and you just suggested personality styles. And again, personality it's a different personality, maybe a different style than you or a different style than you prefer. So you can imagine two people at work, one of which uh, is like Linus, very relaxed, don't worry about it, what's the hurry, everything will be fine. And then the other person is very hands-on, hey, we gotta get this started, let's go. What are you sitting around waiting for? Yes. Right? <laughs> that sounds like you or somebody you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah, that could be a very big source of per, of uh, conflict. And it it's not that one person is right or wrong, good or bad. It's just not your preference. You would relate better to somebody with a different style. Um, what else is there? Mm. What about your boss? Do you ever have a conflict with your boss? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So some bosses are micromanagers. Do you like that? A um, micromanager who gives you detailed instructions, always checking on you, tells you how to do everything. I prefer Basically, moderate. Hmm. I prefer moderate. That means that at least yeah. some guidelines. Then yeah. how we do it is just another way. Yeah. Okay. So so you've got one style of leader who is the micromanager you might have others who don't give you any guidance it's just whatever you do 
I know you'll take care of it. Don't bother me with so many questions, which could be just as frustrating. Although some people like a micromanager, they like to be told everything, not have to think for themselves. Others, they can't stand that, they just wanna be left alone. Others like Mei Shin, I think you suggest you like somebody in between, somebody who gives you some guidance, but not excessive. So you can identify that as a leadership style. And, and again, it's about preference, leadership. Okay, now in the organization, what do different departments have conflicts over? So example, sales and marketing. and maybe accounting. Um, so sales, they always want to spend more money, marketing, spend more money to advertise, to get more clients, etc. Whereas accounting may want to spend less money, you know, if, right? Even though um, both of them may have some merit, it's just a different goal or a different way of, I mean, the ultimate goal is the same. They want the company to be profitable. They want it to remain viable, to grow, et cetera. But they have different ideas about how to do that. Okay. Um, what else do they fight about in the organization? Let's say this is something you've probably all experienced. Somebody in the organization leaves. And what do they do with that person's workload? Do they hire somebody else to replace them right away? Or do they take the work and divide it and give it to different people? Divide to different people. Some, some of them give more, some of them give less. Some of them okay. is the capacity, whether or not does the capacity able to... Uh, yeah whether or not the capacity within the boundaries of knowledge. I mean, that's, that's my, what's my thinking, yeah. All right, and let's say they ultimately hire somebody. They get a new employee. Is there gonna be any dispute about whether they put that person in this department or that department? Might the various managers say, hey, we've been shorthanded, we need the person. No, no, it's more critical. We've got to get another person. Or it could be money even. That's probably the easiest thing to understand. When they make their budgets, everybody wants money, but they always want more than they have. So they've got to make some decisions about who gets more money and who doesn't. So we can say, allocation of funds or resources, even things like time to use equipment, uh, any limited resource could be a source of conflict. And because also, I, I feel that what it could have a person, I mean, this is just my, I just come into my mind, that how could this person de develop and willing to develop into someone that is replaceable in the upcoming future. It means to replace so that the, the person who is assistingly can move up the career ladder. I mean, this is also a conflict. Sometimes the bosses are afraid of their, their role being removed. Okay. This is also potentially create a conflict. But however, okay. this is a this is a very natural blood. I wouldn't say blood. Uh, moving up the career ladder. I mean, okay. that's my thinking. So that sounds like a turf war, where people are fighting to maintain their domain, to to keep their position, uh, maybe at the expense of somebody else, or maybe just protecting against a feared loss of power, influence, authority, whatever it might be. Okay, anything else? 
Uh, sometimes when you have two or more clients and then uh, you're handling the clients and then uh, you need the technical team to uh, do the, the work for them. So the delivery aspect. So you want your clients to be, uh, the delivery to be given for your clients priority, whereas somebody else from the department is fighting for their clients. Okay, so it's about priority. Yeah. Okay, so priority meaning the first first access or first in the queue, that's a limited commodity also. Um, but I think it merits special mention. Priority. Okay, this is a pretty good list. Um, let me ask you guys a question. In your your organization, whatever it may be, uh, have you had any major change initiatives in the last year or so? Probably just since COVID, you've got a lot of changes too. Right? Do we have these changes fairly frequently? It's pretty common. Anytime you have a new boss, they start changing things, don't they? because they have to let people know I'm on the job, I'm doing something, making things better, even though the old way may have been fine. A lot of people prefer the old way. So anytime there's change, which is pretty much always, that could be a source of conflict. So what is, if you had to come up with one key idea or word here, what do you think that would be? What's the one word that kind of runs through all of these ideas? Adaptability? I don't know, maybe. Or consistent? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't catch that mention. Can you say it a little louder? Is it adaptability or consistency? <laughs> it's it, it, it to, to contrast. Ability, are you saying? Okay, contrast is good. That, that's a good word. Um, so contrast is you're comparing one thing with another and you're focusing on what? Similarities or differences? Yeah, maybe being adaptive as well at the same time. Being have a contrast that whether or not being able to catch up, the people able to catch up, maybe. Yeah. So isn't this mostly about differences? You got different goals, different understandings, different styles, preferences, uh, different points of view about how to allocate or prioritize things. It's really all about differences, isn't it? If everybody was the same, there would be no conflict, right? And things would be very boring too. And, and nothing would change, which is also, I mean, some people don't like to change, but change is what people do, okay? It's called progress. We always wanna get better, get more. Uh, so it's really about identifying differences and managing differences in a nutshell. Okay, so let's, um, let me change the screen here for a second. All right, I'm getting a, a message that the host has disabled screen sharing.
Okay. Well, this is not good. All right, I'll have to call them in a second. But just going over the, uh, the model answer, I think all of these were covered except uh, expectations. Okay, when people have different, there's the word again, different expectations about how things should be. And we saw that in the cartoon with Lucy and Linus. People had different expectations and that was the source of conflict. So anything that's different could potentially be a cause for concern or conflict. So let me ask you guys, have you ever heard of the golden rule? I think most people have. Anybody familiar with that? Or the platinum rule, do you know what that is? Sorry, come again, what's the rule? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, muted. <laughs> yeah, the golden rule is the one most people know, which is what? Oh, no. Yeah. The golden rule says, do unto others. I think they gave me my screen back. Um, do um. unto others as you would like them to do unto you, right? And I think we're taught that as children. And uh, is that a good rule? I think through most of history, we've used it probably somewhat successfully. But now there's this new rule called the platinum rule. And platinum is worth more than gold. So platinum is better, the platinum rule. Anybody know what the platinum rule is? Have you heard of that? Platinum rule says not do unto others as you would like them to do with you, but do unto others as they would like to be treated. So it's about their preferences. Uh, and the thinking is, well, not everybody is like you. Everybody is different. And just because you want to be treated one way doesn't mean everybody else wants to. So you have to find out what is their preference and treat them accordingly. So you recognize this gentleman on the screen. You know Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Okay. Uh, now, what was his special ability, his superpower. Alligators? Okay, not just alligators, but any animal, right? I mean, he was good with all kinds of animals. Could be a, a, a lion, a bear, a wolf, a snake. He knew how to handle all of them. And what do you think gave him that ability? Why was he so successful relating to all of these different creatures? Is it because he could talk to them? He understood their nature. He understood their nature. I think it's the courage. Yeah. All right, maybe some courage, but I think it's mostly understands their nature because not every animal is the same, right? And you have to handle them all differently. So you don't treat... Uh, a lion the way you would treat a dog. And you don't treat a snake the way you would treat a bear. You got to treat each one the way they prefer. 
So I think Steve Irwin was successful because he sort of followed the platinum rule instead of the very self-centered golden rule. Uh, so I think, uh, I think that's a pretty good role model. Now the question is, Steve Irwin worked with animals. And if you've studied psychology, you probably understand this concept of how we react or whether we respond. You can, uh, in any stressful or a conflict situation, you have a choice of how to respond. Uh, you could react emotionally, which means in Lucy's case, Linus does something that triggers and she reacts emotionally, doesn't even think about it. Or you could respond intelligently and rationally and choose a response that you think is useful. So in the, in the realm of psychology, which also began studying animals and then later applying these concepts to people, uh, they came up with this, you've probably heard about it, called the fight or flight response. Have you heard of that before? So if you see an animal that's stressed, it's, it's in a potential difficult situation, uh, most animals will try to run away. They'll try to avoid the situation. They don't understand it. They don't know what to do. They don't have a lot of brain power. So they try to avoid the unpleasant situation and run. Uh, other animals, they may fight, especially if they don't have a way to escape, if there's nowhere to run. So you can imagine a little kitten. The kitten is not very threatening. And if it's afraid of you, he'll probably run away. But if he's trapped in the corner and you're picking him up, he can't run, so he might scratch you or bite you and fight. And for animals, that's basically the two responses. There's a third response, which is concede. So the little kitten may think, I can't really run any place. I can't fight this big person. I'll just let him pick me up, and I hope he doesn't hurt me. But I just resign myself to my fate and hope for the best. And people do that too sometimes. They don't run, they don't fight, they just concede and, and go along with whatever the other party demands of them. They comply. But there's a fourth possibility. Any idea what that might be? And, and animals cannot do this, but people can. So in a stressful situation, a human being has the choice they could they could flight, fight, concede, or the fourth thing is what? Negotiation. <laughs> yes. That's right. You could negotiate. Now the cat, the kitten cannot do that. The kitten cannot say, hey, let's talk about this. What are you doing with me? What are your intentions? I just want to be left alone. Is that okay? Uh, but people can do that. So people can discuss, you know, this is what I prefer. I, I try to understand what your thinking is. And then we come up with a solution that's different from what any other creature can do. And in fact, a lot of humans don't really do it very well either. They, some are very quick to, to run away and avoid a difficult situation or a certain person. Others are very uh, combative and they like to argue and fight and make trouble. Others are very weak. They need the assertiveness course. They just give in and they don't stand up for themselves. But um, we've got this fourth ability to negotiate and that is one of the main things we do in order to resolve a conflict situation. So in addition, there's a few other things we can talk about, and some of these we've alluded to already. So we made reference to that common situation between uh, sales, marketing, and accounting, 
where the salespeople want to spend more money to develop business and the accounting people may want to cut costs in order to um, ensure more profitability. So when you have a conflict between these two departments, it might be good to find some way to think of a higher goal. All right, we need to be profitable. I think everybody agrees on that. So then the question becomes, how do we get there? And then they can uh, collaborate and find a way where they can allocate a certain budget and find ways to make the most of it and, and serve both of those ends. Um, sometimes there's blending where they take certain elements of one proposal and combine it with others or compromise, which is very similar, where both sides get something but not as much as they wanted and they find a, a way to resolve it. Um, sometimes a command is the solution. So um, I see the two ladies. Are you both mothers? No? Yes. Okay, so we've got one of each. Uh, so then as a mother, you probably have been in situations where your children are having a conflict and they come to you to resolve it in terms of who gets to, to decide what to watch on TV or who gets to play with a, a certain toy or whatever it might be. Um, and, and you may just dictate a solution. And managers do this too. They just issue a command, this is the way we're gonna settle it. And this is one way of resolving a conflict. Uh, a lot of people may not like it. They don't like to be told they have to do something, but it's, it's something we do. And especially in a crisis situation where you may not have a lot of time to build a more consensus driven response than a command, somebody needs to take charge and settle the, the question on the spot. So that's another technique we use. Uh, what about structural change? Sometimes we change the arrangement. Uh, for example, imagine you have a job that you pretty much love. 99% of it is perfect, you're so happy, but there's one thing that you have to do as part of your job that you really cannot stand doing. And it, and it makes you very demotivated. And you're thinking, if I could get rid of this one task, this one responsibility, my life would be perfect. And then you find a colleague who has the same kind of uh, situation, except they've got a different task that they don't like. And you find that, hey, I don't mind doing that thing you don't like, and they don't mind doing what you don't like. Can you trade? those responsibilities and basically redesign your job description a little bit so that it's it's more satisfying for you and also for that other person is this something you can do i mean you may want to but will hr allow this HR will probably say, well, if you're going to change that description, then I've got to go and change everything and somebody else is going to want it. And, and this is why we have job descriptions to avoid that kind of confusion. They like the structure. They don't like to change. But they're just thinking, this is really about my convenience. I don't want to have to worry about this. Um, but in a perfect world, you'd be able to do this. And maybe in some organizations you can. But we do this all the time. We make structural changes, we redeploy people, uh, we reorganize, and that's supposed to sometimes resolve these disputes. So when you were in school, what happens if you didn't get along with the person next to you? Would the teacher change your seat, right? They ah, okay. Yeah, that's structural change, isn't it? 
direction. You're saying, all right, how can we move things around, move the pieces around to avoid or resolve or manage this conflict? Because it's easier than changing the other person or changing yourself. Okay, so that's something that's quite common. And then the last technique that we cover in the course is personal change. And a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot, but some people come to the course thinking, I'm going to learn the secret to making everybody easier to get along with so I don't have any more conflicts in my life. Um, but I think most people understand you're not going to change the other person. Uh, because it's impossible. You can't make them change. You might be able to influence them, but it's very, very difficult to change somebody else. So then the question is, can you change yourself? Is that possible? Yes. So that's easy, right? We just change. Whenever we have a conflict, we can change and things are better. Correct? Or is it hard to change yourself? Very difficult to change yourself. You know, New Year's resolutions used to be a thing. A lot of people would do it, but uh, over the years, I noticed very few people even bother anymore. I think they pretty much gave up because it never seems to work. And, and you go to the bookstore, if the bookstores were open, um, most adults, except maybe some like fiction, but most adults go to the self-help section. People want to invest better. They want to negotiate better. They want to manage better. Mm -hmm. uh, right? It's about changing yourself. And we know how hard that is, too, because people go to courses. They don't change. They go to another course. They don't change. So... If you can't change other people and it's very difficult to change yourself, what, what other choice is there? Is there a third possibility? Where do I change? <laughs> but, but you cannot change yourself so much that you wouldn't recognize yourself that hey, you will regret the decision later. Well, you may yeah. or may not, and you may be able to change back if that's the case. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to show you guys a short video. It, it's quite short, less than two minutes. But it's it raises some very interesting issues. And one of the issues it, it addresses is this third option, if I can't change myself or change other people, is there any hope for me to improve this situation I have? Um, and he's spe speaking specifically about education. Uh, this is a guy you'll see named Benjamin Zander. He's a conductor of an orchestra, and he teaches in a music conservatory. So he has tertiary level students who want to be professional musicians in his class. And he comes up with a very interesting approach. Um, and I wonder, I mean, I haven't gone to school in Singapore, my daughter does, but I, I wonder if MOE would ever consider his approach. And I want you to think about that also as we watch this short video. So I'll, I'll let you see the video and then we'll discuss what we take away from that. I came home from class one day and I said to Roz, who is my uh, partner and my coach, Roz, I said, what can we do? What can we do? These students are so anxious. They're so concerned. They're so worried about the auditions, about the, 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 the grades and that they're getting and the competitions. And they're so anxious. They cannot take the risks with their lives that they need to take in order to be great artists. What can we do? And she came up with this beautiful idea. And this is what I do. And I'll share it with you exactly how it works. I come into my class at the beginning of the year. And I have 40 students or so in the room. And I say to them, your grade is an A. That is your grade. 
for the rest of the year. You are an A student. And there's one condition. You have to write me a letter in the first two weeks, which is dated at the end of May when the class ends. Right? So the date at the top is May of the next year, and the letter must begin like this. Dear Mr. Zander, I got my A because. You then have to write a letter, which is written, as it were, in, 90, in the following year, and describes who you will have become at the end of the year. And when I come into the room, they write about who they would be and who they could be, who they see themselves as if only the voice would stop telling them they can't do it. And when I come into the class, the person I teach is the person that they have described in their letter. You see, I only take A students. Now, it's interesting, there are a few people I see in the room looking a little confused, saying, how can he do that? What? Now, the thing is, you can give an A to anybody. You can give an A to anybody, to a waitress, to a taxi driver, to your mother-in-law. You can give an A to anybody. <laughs> and what happens when you give an A is that the relationship is transformed. The relationship is transformed. Think about it. I and mean, Rod is a therapist, and she says, when there's a breakdown in a relationship, you're not giving somebody an A. Okay. So this concept of giving an A interesting idea. Is this something that the Singapore school system would ever allow? Remember, he's got his music students on the first day of class. He gives them all an A. All they have to do is write a letter explaining who they're going to be by the end of the year, how they will grow and develop as a result of, of this class. Um, and they get their A. Now, why would they not do this with the MOE? Why would they not allow this? So Anita, you, you have kids, how old are they? I have one son, 24. One son? And he's how old? 24. 24, okay. So he's been through the whole system here. Uh, do you see this happening? where teachers in Singapore give everybody in the class an A on the first day of school and all they have to do is write this silly letter or it will never happen. Yeah. It will never happen. And the reason is, the thinking is, wait, if I give him an A, then he may not put in the effort that an A would require and he's taking advantage of us. He's beating the system and we can't allow that. Um, and the focus is on taking the people who will, you know, misbehave or take advantage and not letting them do that. And they don't pay attention. Now, Xander's approach, he's not worried about the people who, who don't deserve the A. Maybe they'll get it anyway, but if, if their habits aren't good, if they don't practice, if they don't put in the effort, they're not going to make it as a professional musician, right? There are not that many jobs in orchestras in the whole world for every music student to get the job they want. So only the best, the most diligent are going to make it. So he doesn't worry about the low end of the, of the, of the curve. Uh, his concern is with the top students. And because they've got this grade, they're thinking, all right, if, if I take a hard class or if I take a difficult piece, I'm more likely to make a mistake and it, I may not get the grade I want. So let me play it safe and, and take an easier piece and play that. And he doesn't want that. He, he, so this, this way of giving an A is a way of saying, look, I want you to take a risk. I want you to 
challenge yourself and try to be better than you might otherwise ever do. And, and you don't have to worry about the grade. Okay, don't let that stop you. So maybe some of his students take advantage, but they probably don't get the best jobs or even a job in an orchestra. But the, the top students are going to do even better. They're going to excel to the next level because they don't have to worry about paying a price. So you see how that works. Now, he made an interesting comment. You can give an A to anybody, you know, not just to students who literally get the A, but metaphorically to anybody. So we'll, we'll talk in a minute about your, your colleagues, um, how you might give an A to them. Um, but first I wanna point out something I mentioned. Uh, you can't change other people. It's very hard to change yourself. What is the third possibility? And towards the end, he said it. He said, when you give somebody an A, what? What comes next? He said it twice. When you give somebody an A, the relationship is what? Did you catch that? The relationship is transformed. Remember that? Interesting idea. So what he's saying is, let me try this. Uh, I'm gonna share the screen a different way with the whiteboard again. Okay, where's my whiteboard? Okay. Can you all see that? Got to erase this. Okay. So let's say that's you. Okay. And as we saw, very hard to change yourself. And let's come up with somebody else. So this is them. And it's hard to change them, or impossible to change them, difficult to change yourself. And Xander is saying, when you give them an A, so you're giving them A, the relationship is transformed. So where is the relationship? Okay, isn't that it? So you got your life, your job, your family, your problems. They also have all of their stuff. And then where you and them intersect, overlap, isn't that your relationship? That's how you would represent a relationship. So that relationship is transformed by giving them an A. Now notice you're not changing yourself and you're not changing them. You're just changing the relationship if he's right. And the relationship is really all you're concerned about because you're not interested in, in changing their family or changing their hobbies. You're interested only in changing that part of their life that overlaps your own life, your work relationship. 
by giving an A. So, so how can we do that? What are some ways where, where'd that go? What are some of the ways you can give somebody an A at work? Acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. Give credit. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Full appreciation. Okay, so, so you guys are pretty good because a lot of, a lot of groups find this very abstract. Um, so in the classroom, he's giving the A. He's basically saying, I believe in you. I, I know you can do well. I'm showing you my confidence. Not after the fact, but in advance. So, so this is really about acknowledging or validating or valuing somebody without them having to earn it. And the idea is when you show that kind of appreciation, they will reciprocate later. And you may have heard this metaphor, people live up to your expectations. So if you expect a lot, they tend to, to give more. If you don't expect much, they don't give very much. Uh, certainly in, in parenting, we, we hear this concept. So again, just like in the, in the classroom, some people will take advantage. And whatever you give them in terms of giving them the A, they will take it and, and not reciprocate. But reciprocation is something that's wired into most people. And if you do something for them, they feel an obligation to do something to return the favor or return the compliment or whatever it may be. So that's, that's another one, you know, compliment people. What else can you do with colleagues that will be sort of an advanced payment that will improve your relationship with them? improve the way you interact and work with them? Offer help, initiative, I don't know. Okay, so help them or do them a favor or give them some sort of support. And then later they'll remember that and say, she was nice to me, I wanna help her with this thing. Now that she needs something, okay. And what else can you do to show you value people? You can give them a treat of some sort. Right, just a little token of your appreciation. It could be a, a coffee, a muffin, right? Just a little token. Now, the treat is gonna cost you money, usually, um, but not a lot. Let's say you decide, I'm gonna start my own give and a fund. I'm gonna give myself a budget of $5 a week so that I can just do little things for the people around me, the people I work with. Um, so that'll be $250 a year. Is that something that you can manage? Probably. Is that gonna gain you more than $250 worth of goodwill and benefit? Most likely. Um, but the other things on this list, they don't cost anything, do they? They're all free. And 
do they require any special skill to give credit, to acknowledge, to accomplish, compliment? Do any of these take a lot of skill or any skill really? No, we can all do them. Uh, do they take too much time? Well, you know, giving recognition, that takes all day. I can't do that. No. So let's summarize. It's, it's easy to do and no skill required. It doesn't take much time, just maybe a few seconds. Uh, or in the case of maybe taking a personal interest in this colleague, by asking them questions and getting to know them a little better. That might take a few minutes, but I think any manager, no matter how busy, has time to do these and has the skill. And maybe, you know, you spend a little bit of money, but not even required. Uh, so you might think, wow, this is easy. We should all do this all the time, right? Do we find people doing this all the time? We're hardly ever. It's more like hardly ever, right? Very rare to see much of this in the workplace. And, and given how easy and, and quick and, and cheap it is, we should be doing it a lot more. Uh, so that's one thing you can do, you know, that will improve your relationships, this thing in the middle with the people around you, uh, quite simple. All right, so any questions so far? Okay, there's just one little bit I wanna cover this morning and it's a, it's a video also, another video you get to see. This is about four minutes. It's from a movie you may have seen called As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt. Uh, you like that movie, Mation? Looks like you're reacting like, I like that movie. Okay, um, about four minutes. And, and if you remember the movie, uh, Jack Nicholson's character, Melvin Udall, is not a really nice guy. He, he kind of bullies people. Um, but he mellows towards the end. And here's uh, an interesting situation we'll talk about for a couple of minutes and then we'll be done. So let me get that queued up for you. What you just said hurt my feelings. Marco, when someone gets that they need you, they threaten to walk out. A compliment is something nice about somebody else. This is a request from June. And now or never. Okay. Happy anniversary. Mean it. Water first. Okay. Um, two hard shell crab dinners, 
Get your ice cold beer. Uh, baked or fries? Fries. One baked, one fried. I'll tell your waiter. He'll bring something for you. It's true. I'm so afraid you're about to say something awful. Don't be pessimistic. It's not your style. Okay. Here I go. Clearly a mistake. I've got this, what, ailment. My doctor, a shrink that I used to go to all the time says that in 50 or 60 percent of the cases a pill really helps i hate pills very dangerous thing pills hate i'm using the word hate here about pills hate my compliment is that night when you came home and told me that you would never um, um, all right well you were there you know, you know what you said well my compliment to you is the next morning, I started taking the pills. I don't quite get how that's a compliment for me. You make me want to be a better man. That's maybe the best compliment of my life. Well, maybe I overshot a little because I was aiming at just enough to keep you from walking out. Okay, so was that entertaining? As good as you remember? Um, all right, in the, uh, the full course, we spent some time talking about what are the different kinds of compliments, the best way, because it's one of the easiest ways to give an A and improve the uh, relationships with the people around us at work and, and elsewhere. Um, any questions about anything we talked about today or what we cover in the course? All right, I want to thank you guys, especially the, the two ladies for being brave enough to show your smiling faces. So I, I think the rest of the people out there are also real, but I can't be sure I don't see them. Um, so Aventus uh, offers this course, as I said, a few times a year, uh, about four times a year. And uh, they've been working at this since 2008. I've been with them most of that time. And if you want to sign up for this next course, which will be in September, hopefully uh, it will be live um, if, if things improve by then and and the hotel they have the courses at the concord they've got a wonderful peronican buffet uh, over the years i've eaten probably a, a few hundred times there i never get tired of it it's really good um, so there's a promotional code you can use the qr code or you can just call rena or email, uh, however you want to do it. Um, and hopefully I'll see some of you guys in that class or in one of the other courses we teach. And also um, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and follow Aventus. And so the last chance, if anybody has a question you can take it now or forever hold your peace, as they say. 
or if you think of one later, you can uh, email me or, or contact Eventus. All right, everybody good? All right, well, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, at this point, since there are no questions, I'm going to end the meeting. So enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>